Welcome to another uh, hour of Gate City Chronicle, the weekly magazine dedicated to the city of Nashua. I'm Kevin Avard, your host. Uh, it's that time of year, and uh, many of you probably have questions uh, regarding your taxes. Uh, some of you are probably small business owners who are, are scrambling, getting all those receipts out of the boxes. Some of you probably have W-2 that you just put in, don't even think about it, just wait for that check. Uh, with everything changing in our economy, uh, a lot of us have a lot of questions. And I have a very special guest with me this week uh, from H&R Block, uh, Mr. Uh, Richard Hendel. And uh, Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. Nice to be here. Pleasure to have you. Well, well pleasure that you came. I really appreciate you coming because, uh, again, it, it's a serious time of year. And uh, everybody kind of scrambles. And you, know, you think of uh, tax season, all of a sudden those beads of sweat come on the neck. And uh, what am I going to do? What am I, how am I going to pay this? And all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things we were talking about before we came on air was the fact that you're an enrolled agent for the IRS, um, not for the IRS, but for the H&R Block. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? What is an enrolled agent? Is that just, uh, are you a manager? Or? No, far from it. An enrolled agent is the only status that the IRS itself administers. In order to become an enrolled agent, you've got to take a two-day rather comprehensive exam that the IRS uh, grades gives you. You've got to pass uh, some ethics uh, stat, uh, goals. You've also got to make sure that all of your prior year tax returns have been filed on time and everything is, is fine with them. And you also then have to take 24 hours a year of continuing education credits in order to maintain your status as an enrolled agent. Enrolled agent status gives us the capability of representing clients who may have problems with the IRS, either with the client or with a properly executed power of attorney, we can go in their place. We can work out problems, get uh, problems resolved, um, set up payment plans, uh, and in the extreme, perhaps even arrange for what's called an offer and compromise with the IRS. If somebody is never going to be able to pay that tax bill, we fill out a great uh, comprehensive financial analysis for the client, and then the IRS may accept a smaller amount, but this is the this is the last step in the uh, in the uh, audit process. Right. There are two other statuses that are in the same situation, in far as far as being able to represent clients. These are CPAs and tax attorneys, but CPAs and tax attorneys are licensed by the states in which they uh, which they practice, not by the IRS. So the enrolled agent is unique in this aspect that the IRS itself recognizes the status and maintains the, the credentials for. Uh, enrolled agents. And by the way, H&R Block uh, employs more enrolled agents than any other tax preparation company in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. So you really have to be up to speed on, on things. Right. Uh, as we were, again, we were talking just before the cameras came on, we were, we were talking about all the changes that are happening with, with the, the Obamacare, uh, with, with the, the extensions, uh, and a lot of us are, are wondering, wow, where is this going to take us? Uh, and one of the things that we did bring up uh, was the fact that some people are, are, are losing their homes. Right. And I asked you a question about the balance on the homes. If, if mm -hmm. somebody uh, is getting foreclosed, uh, could you tell me a little bit about that process real quickly? Do they owe taxes on that, that balance? Or? Well, whenever debt is canceled, and certainly a mortgage falls in that category, the potential to have that amount taxable is very great. Let me give you the most basic example. A client comes in, has had some credit card debt forgiven by the credit card company. Mm -hmm. They're going to get a form 1099-C, which is a cancellation of debt form. The IRS recognizes that, in, as, that as income because they've received the service and now they, they haven't paid for it, so it's just as though someone has given them money. Right. They would pay taxes on that situation as long as they weren't bankrupt, Those, as long as they haven't filed bankruptcy or they weren't insolvent. Foreclosures of homes are in that category, but uh, a few years ago, the Congress has, had made the decision and passed a law that if it's your primary residence, that would not count as taxable income under, under many complicated circumstances. But most people who have their homes foreclosed can find that they will not owe uh, on their balance due if, if the home is not worth as much as their mortgage is. Now this, again, with all the shifting things, the shifting mm -hmm. sand and the rules that are changing, uh, how can somebody start getting prepared for their taxes this year? If, you, if you're a small business or if you own some property, what are the, some of the things that uh, we need to start doing? Okay. The time to start preparing for your taxes is right now. 
If you start right now preparing for 2012, you'll be in a lot better shape. I advise my clients, especially those who are in small business, who um, have investments, who itemize their deductions, get yourself a shoebox if necessary, or an envelope, or a folio, or anything that you have during the year that you think is going to support your taxes, put right in there. I find that it's easier for somebody to bring in more information than we can use. You can always discard the things that don't, uh, don't apply. Right. It's very difficult to, on the spot, try to, try to make something uh, that's justifiable. In the case of a small business, uh, you've got a bigger job to do because you've got to know, not only keep track of all of your income, probably yourself, but you've got to keep track of all those receipts, all those expenses, and it should be done contemporaneously. In other words, you should be doing that as you go. Every day, if you get an income, you record that. You record your expenses. If you drive for business purposes, you record the mileage, where you went, you know, how far it was. The IRS looks for uh, in, uh, supporting data that are prepared on a day-to-day -day basis. They do not like to see something that looks like it was just done last night. Right. And for all of the you know, cross-outs and notes on the side, that's the kind of documentation that can support a, a great deal of information. Then the next thing is to get out your last year's tax return. Set it down next to what you've got now and, and decide what's changed. Has, have, has something changed that I have to worry about? My income. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. But in the case of individuals, you might have changed jobs. You might have retired. You may have started to collect Social Security. You may have started to collect unemployment for some reason. So what you want to do is say, okay, these are the forms I needed last year. Here are the changes. Here are the forms I should expect this year. Right. Every time you receive a payment from an organization, you're going to get a piece of paper that documents that for your taxes, if you're a, a, the normal taxpayer. Right. The IRS also gets a copy of that, and that's what happens in the 18 months after you file. The IRS by computer is matching up all those documents. Yeah. Letters go out then if they, there's a mismatch. In the case of a self-employed individual, you've got to make sure that you can document your income and you can document all those expenses. Now, self-employed individuals can claim more expenses than employees, but we, those, those are very, very um, sometimes complicated differences. All I can uh, advise folks is keep track of your financial life during the year. Start with the last year's tax return. Use a software program. You commented on all the changes. It's almost impossible to keep up with all those changes and prepare your tax return manually. If you decide you're going to do it manually, for heaven's sakes, check your arithmetic and don't forget to sign the return. Failing to sign the return is one of the biggest reasons people get their returns back. Ooh. So you, you, you've got to take that. Now, you'll hear a lot about electronic filing. The IRS is going to require that everyone file electronically in the, in the out years. The reason for that is, is many fold, but the IRS is swamped in paper if they get paper returns. Right. It keeps the error rate down because if you prepare the return and you prepare it correctly, you electronically file it, it's received at the IRS in their computers the same way you prepared it. If you send it in manually, it goes to an IRS center like Andover or Kansas City, and some key punch operator is sitting down there and replicating what you've done. Well, there's another source of error that, that right. can creep in. So electronic filing is fast, it's accurate, and it's secure. And I assume H&R Block we, yes, provides we, that. Yes, we do electronic filing. Most, most of our returns are electronically filed. Right. There are some circumstances where you can't electronically file, but they're getting fewer and fewer every year. So you're a typical small business. You've been in business for a number of years, and uh, my gosh, business, business has gone south. You file an extension. You find out that you owe the IRS some extra money. And you get on a payment plan, and my gosh, gas prices went up, business has gone down, and then you find yourself in a real corner. Now, I have this rolling debt with the IRS who's probably penalizing you on top of everything else. What can you do if you, if you're, if you're finally at your end and you say, my God, uh, I'm, I'm in a corner? Okay, well, the first, the first thing you mentioned is one of our, it was one of our myths. If you file an extension, it's not an extension to pay, it's an extension to file. You still have to make a good faith effort to pay the amount you think you're going to owe by the, this year, the 17th of April. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you're already going to start to accrue, in, accrue interest on that uh, payment. All right. So you file your, your taxes, you find you can't pay the balance, you set up an installment plan with the IRS, you find next year that you're in the same situation, maybe a little worse, 
they'll extend the installment plan, but at some point, if you find that I'm just never going to be able to pay this, the next thing is we go into the IRS, we sit down with an agent, and we lay out your situation, and he may or may not, or she may or may not, decide that, that the requirement is going to be reduced, or they may require you to fill out the paperwork for an offer and compromise. Offer and compromise requires pages of you filling out all of your financial situation, all the assets you own, all the um, liabilities you have. Then the agent makes a, d a decision. Mm -hmm. Will you, Kevin, ever be able to pay this? And if the answer is yes, they'll just keep extending that. And if there is an interest every month, of course. Uh, if they decide, you know, Kevin's just never, ever going to pay us, then they will come to some kind of an agreement that uh, you, you agree to, and then you'll both, the IRS will sign off on it, you'll sign off on it, and then some um, arrangement will be made by which you pay that amount. And so that's basically short of, of uh, a bankruptcy filing. That is short of bankruptcy, right. right. If you file bankruptcy, you can't discharge uh, income tax debt unless the income tax debt is more than three years old. Um, but even in that, you may or may not, depending on the situation, be able to even uh, discharge it at that point. Now, you said that is one common myth. What, what, what seems to be uh, one of the uh, high-ranking other myths that, that Well, we, we've got, you know, I, I teach courses for HR Block, and I have two axioms that I try to tell my students. First is never use logic and taxes in the same sentence. <laughs> and the second is that most, most myths come about because people think that the best tax preparers in the world work for a firm that I call Friends and Family Incorporated. They're more willing to turn to their brother-in-law, their uncle, their neighbor, and, and ask them for tax advice than they are to go to the IRS or to come to someone like me. Right. So myths are all over the place. And, and one of the biggest ones we run into is, you know, I didn't earn any money this year, so I don't have to pay taxes. That may or may not be true. What they think in their mind is, and especially, this is especially true of retired people, you know, I just got Social Security, I sold some stock, but I sold it at a loss. So I didn't make any money, I don't file. Oh. Well, if you look at the tax law, the tax law says that your filing responsibility is, is based on not your net income, but your gross income. So if that couple sold uh, uh, 100 shares of uh, Apple stock for $50,000, and they bought it for $51,000, they have a $1,000 loss. But the IRS says, no, no, your gross income is $50,000 until we see that tax return that tells us that you lost $1,000. Now, what about the principal on that, though? Is that rolled into the, 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 if you put in, is your principal considered part of the income as well? No. It's only what you get for the proceeds, the I gross see. proceeds right. that you sell it. Okay. Now, your basis, your, what you paid for it, may be more, so you have a loss. But all the IRS sees up until now is what you sold it for. They don't know, and they're be taking steps to correct that, but it's going to take years before it all washes through the system. All they see right now is that you got $50,000 from selling that stock. They don't know if somebody gave it to you. You, were, you, know, you, were, oh, you, you, you right. paid uh, a 10 cents a share for it or $10 or $100. They want to see that tax return. So all the filing requirements are based on your gross income, not your net income. And that's one of the, one of the misconceptions. <clears throat> well, as a small business owner that is highly dependent upon gas, <laughs> <laughs> is, the is the deduction for, for gas uh, going up at all? Or? The, the, the deduction for gas went up on the 1st of July. It went from 51 cents a mile to 55 and a half cents a mile. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, this is one of those things that drive us crazy. Yeah. Whenever an adjustment starts at the beginning of the year, that's fine. Because you're, you're dealing with the same rules all year. The tax law changes at... In the middle of the year, now you've got a bigger problem because you've got to keep track of your miles that you drove before the, the 1st of July and after the 1st of July. Amazing. We've got a problem because most people don't know about that. And we come, how many miles did you drive? And, and they don't know, you know. So then they go back and go through their records. So it creates a lot of work. Wow. We would all like to see the tax law change on, the, on, the, on New Year's Day and then leave it for the rest of the, of the year. Now, getting back to the gross income requirements, and you probably have run into this, Kevin. A lot of people think that New Hampshire doesn't have any, ta you know, no income taxes, no taxes. Well, that's true by and large. But you as a small business owner, if you gross more than $50,000, you've got to file a business profits tax right. return. 
Now, it may all to come out that you don't owe anything because all of your profit is, is personal compensation, and that's not taxed. But if it's not, you're going to owe tax on, on, the, on the residual. Right. If you take in more than $150,000, you also have to then file a business enterprise tax return. And here is a little bit less forgiving because the business enterprise base is not only compensation you've paid not only to yourself but to your employees, but any interest you might have paid for the business and any dividends you paid. Most small business owners don't pay any dividends, but if you've got any uh, mortgaged uh, capital investment, you're going to be paying interest. So that goes into your, into your business enterprise base. I was talking to a state rep uh, not too long ago, uh, Representative Hull from uh, Dunbarton, and uh, he had mentioned something about the, I guess it's called the BE tax. Mm -hmm. And basically, he said, as soon as uh, you start up a business, if you take a loan out for three hundred thousand dollars, you will you owe a tax on that's that. right, that's right, because it is reported as income. <laughs> right. Well, it's not reported as income; it's taxed as business enterprise base. Okay. So, in fact, I'm working with a client right now who has a lot of rental properties and has lost money on every one of them, but his mortgage interest exceeds the hundred and fifty thousand dollars, so he's paying t a tax on mortgage interest and he's not making any money on the rental property. There's, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Uh -huh. I, I just read recently, and maybe you, know more, you probably know more about it than I do, that there's a, a bill in the legislature or in committee that would raise the limits on the business profits tax from fifty dollars to $100,000 and on the business enterprise tax from one hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000. Right. That's a good step in the right direction because it takes the, the small business owner the small landlord sort of out of the out of the tax liability picture. It seems so. It is also increased from five percent or a quarter to a full percent or something to that effect. I'm yeah, they're they're always changing that. The the uh, the business profits tax is seven and a half, and the business enterprise tax is is I think eight and a half. Uh, it I have a hard time keeping track of the exact figures because they keep changing. But uh, then you can get a credit on your business profits tax from the business enterprise tax. So there's there's a lot of um, uh, complications with someone in your situation if you have to file both of them. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard sailing through this, this menage. Uh, or, uh, it's, it's, a, it's amazing how complicated our whole system is. Right. I know some state reps want to get rid of the, the whole business profit tax altogether. All well, if you, if you look at some of the, uh, the New Hampshire business taxes, they're among, getting to be among the highest in the country. And, could, uh, could, could you repeat that one more time? One more time. If you look at some of the New Hampshire business taxes, they're getting to be some of the highest in, in the country at, at the state level. Right. And uh, I'm afraid that someone like yourself, I know this, this uh, individual that I'm working with with the rental properties, is wondering why he's doing this. Uh, he's not making any money, but he still owes taxes to, to the state. Uh, the other thing that, well, as long as we're on New Hampshire, uh, you are aware, I'm sure, that the gambling tax was re repealed. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't repealed as of the 1st of January. It wasn't retroactive. It was repealed as of the 22nd of May. So anybody who was fortunate enough to win the lottery from the 1st of the year to the 22nd of May is going to pay 10% gambling tax. If you were really lucky and won it on the 23rd of May, then you're not going to pay any tax at all. Oh, well, I plan on winning tonight. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> exactly. OK, well, uh, let's stay on the uh, whole process of myths. On the myths, well, OK. Many people, and this gets back to, the, to the, the, I didn't have any money so I don't have to pay taxes. Many people think that as soon as you're 65, your tax liability is over. There is no age limit to taxes on either end, because a lot of people think that, children, that students are exempt, and we'll get to that in a moment. Everybody is bound by the same rules. It's the gross income test, basically. For example, somebody who's single can earn up to $9,500 and then not pay any tax because that's the combination of their personal exemption of $3,700 and their uh, standard exemption of $5,800. So that says you don't have to pay any tax, and you don't even have to file if you, if you don't earn more than that, unless you can be claimed as a dependent by somebody else. We'll get to that in a minute, too. <laughs> the only reason people who will file in that situation is if they've had taxes withheld. So let's get back to the myth on the other end of the spectrum. Students are exempt from taxes. Students are exempt from taxes if they earn less than the standard deduction, because in most cases, their parents, in most every case, their parents are going to claim as dependents. So they don't get their standard, their personal exemption. Their parents do. So now we're back to $5,800 as a taxable income for most students. And these are high school students who have not yet achieved the 19th birthday 
and college students who have not yet achieved their 24th birthday. 24th. As long as they don't provide more than half of their own support, their parents get to claim them. So when a student, mostly high school students, go to uh, Shaw's, let's say, and work uh, at Shaw's, they can check a box that says exempt because last year they didn't have any tax liability. This year they, they estimate they will not have any tax liability. So now Shaw's is not going to deduct any federal income taxes. Mm. The catch is that if they do better and they make $6,500, they're going to have to file because they're over that $5,800 limit because their folks are claiming them as dependents. So they're going to owe money. So the exempt myth comes from most high school students not getting over the uh, standard deduction and they can check that exempt box on the W-4. Hmm. Now let's get back to the situation where the student is claimed by their parents as a dependent. Situation up until 19, if you're a full-time student, and a full-time student is a very generous definition. If you're a full-time student for any or part of five calendar months, you're considered to be a full-time student for the year. Those folks, if they're not 19 or if they're going to school, they're going to college, up until they're 24, have to be claimed by their parents. They cannot claim their own dependency, their own, their own exemption. Most young folks get their W-2s earlier than their parents do, and they run off and file their taxes, claim themselves as a dependent, get a bigger refund. Now their folks go and, and file their taxes. They claim Johnny, and the IRS says, tilt only one of you can claim Johnny. <laughs> Sorry about so, that. So the, the parents' return gets rejected. Ooh. And now you, you, the, the client comes back in if they're a client of ours, and we ask them this question when we prepare their taxes, but there's no coordination sometimes between... It de does it happen? Do you see it a lot? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so yeah. Th because this is a myth, this is, this is something right. that, hey, folks, let's pay attention. Right. Students don't have to pay taxes, so, you know. But we try to encourage parents to, you know, coordinate this with your son or daughter. You are not going to claim your own dependent, your own dependency exemption. We're going to claim that, and you're going to just have to pay more taxes if you earn more than $5,800 this year. That is one thing that could save everybody a lot of problems because that, otherwise we have to do amend, amended returns for the students or amended returns for the parents creates a lot of unnecessary paperwork. So this is one of those, another one of those myths that we'd like to, would like to clear up. Um, another one is that, gee, I filed my return and I made a mistake, so I'll file another one. The IRS doesn't want to see a second tax return. They, if you've made a mistake, they want to see an amendment. So you have to go through the amending process, which is not terribly complex. What you do is you compare what you filed with what you should have filed, and, and, and then there's an adjudication there, and you may get a refund. You may have to pay a little more, but okay. it's a separate return. It's not a, a second, a second uh, return. So they'll look at one and say, well, which one's true? Uh, no, this isn't is going to work. If okay. you file electronically, they won't even accept the second one. It'll just bounce because it... it You've already filed under your name and Social Security number and birthday. And that's the, that's, those are the three things that the IRS checks initially when they get a return. Your Social Security number, does it match your name? Does it match your birthday? If it does, it's a legitimate return and it'll accept it. If it's not, if it's electronically, it'll get bounced. Or if it's manually, it'll get mailed back to you and say, hey, you know, there's some, some problem here. On the side of the myths, I'm, I, one of the things that's, that's just haunting my, my, my brain is this the whole change in the, the Medicare system, the whole change in, uh, not Medicare, but the, the Obamacare. Mm -hmm. uh, when does it start? When, when do we start preparing for it? Is, is there going to be some changes now, or is it going to be next year? When do we start paying taxes on it? Uh, when do we start getting benefits from it? Uh, do you know? Did you read all the 2,000 uh, pages? No, I didn't. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I, I can give you some general guidelines. First of all, the, the real impact doesn't start until 2014. Oh, just after the election. I, you, you caught that on. Very, very, very good, Kevin. There are some minor changes that are happening now. And 2014, now people like yourselves, if you, if you employ a certain number of people, you know, you'll either have to uh, offer them health insurance or you, you, they get thrown into the, uh, the, the pool or whatever it is. And I'm not even sure that the, that the government knows exactly what all the steps are going to be. But I do know that starting 2014, uh, there'll be some kind of a penalty if you don't have health insurance, um, that more and more businesses will, they've already started to opt out of 
providing health insurance for their employees, you see a whole list of, of companies and organizations that have gotten waivers, you know, exempting them from the requirements. So it's not clear where all this is going. And I think that uh, depending on the outcome of this election, we may, see, we may see some big changes in Obamacare. But folks like yourselves, like yourself, a small business owner, uh, are really very worried, and rightly so, about what the financial impact is going to be. If, if for some reason, uh, uh, Mr. Obama gets in and uh, Obamacare stays there, what does that mean for uh, an immediate liability if you, for a small business like myself who's struggling to keep the gas going in the vehicles to, to, to clean the carpets? Uh, am I already going to get nailed with a $3,000 a bill if I don't have uh, health insurance? Well, if you have a certain number of employees, then, th then you'll be expected to provide health insurance. Now, you can also, my understanding is, not offer any at all. Then you yourself would have to go out and get an individual policy if you wanted to avoid the, the fine and, and all your employees would have to make their own arrangements. And here again, this is where the, 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 the questions are. You know, they say that the devil is in the details. Well. There's lots of details that haven't even been worked out yet, and I'm not even sure they've been read. I mean, right, let's vote for the bill so we can find out what's in it. There you Thank go. You, We've Ms. heard Pelosi. that before. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's the big problem. You know, these things are voted on sometimes. Nobody really understands what the impact is. And there are big blanks that here's, here's an over, overarching guideline, and then some staff members or somebody write in the details, and, and you don't know until, until uh, it gets published somewhere. Will this affect seniors in any way? What's going to affect seniors is how Medicare is going to change. Okay. You know, Medicare is supposed to be $500 billion taken out of Medicare. And there's already talk of uh, higher income seniors having to be means tested to get Medicare and Social Security. Uh, the uh, co-pays going up if you're above a certain level. Uh, those details are, are still to be determined. Are there any tax changes as far as seniors at this point that, that, that will be effective this year? This that, year? Yeah. No. That they, okay, so no. again, after 2014 maybe. Right. And it's, th that is mostly in the, in the health uh, uh, area. But um, the, there are very few tax changes this year. The, the big one that everybody heard about with the, was the uh, employment tax extension for two months. Right. Now here's, here's one of those things that is two months and some of the bigger um, payroll uh, service companies said that they couldn't even reprogram their computers in time and then if it's not extended they'll have to do it again so um, we live in interesting times don't we, we? live in interesting <laughs> times yes <laughs> well let's talk let's get back to some of the myths again what are what, uh, you know again one of the, okay. the biggies Here, here's here's one that we run into all the time um, and, and there are sort of two that are related a couple will come in and say well we're married so we have to file jointly well, that is the better way to do it, but you can always file separately, married filing separately. Each person files their own tax return. The spouses are cross-referenced cross on the other tax return, and you, and you go along as though you're almost single. The downside is that if you file separately, you will not get many tax credits and, and tax deductions. So that is the most onerous uh, way to file. Where this comes into, into play most often is we'll, we'll sit down with a couple and one, one half of the couple will owe either back taxes, back child support, they haven't paid their, um, their student loans interest. Uh, so they'll say, well, we have to file separately because uh, if, I, if we don't, the IRS is going to take all of the return, all of any return that we get, and which is true, they will. Unless you file what's called an injured spouse form, you file jointly, you file an injured spouse form that it basically says, uh, IRS, only one of us is responsible for the back taxes or whatever, and we divide up the income, we divide up the uh, deductions, we divide up the dependents, and you submit that, and the IRS then analyzes that return and decides, okay, wh how much of that tax liability goes to the husband, how much goes to the wife? And if the husband owes and he's gonna get a refund based on that analysis, then the IRS will just take his and send the wife her refund. So there is a way to separate it, even though you're filing it jointly. It's just called an injured spouse form, 
and it takes um, a very short time to fill that out. And that, Which that, accomplishes everything, basically, that you wanted from the, the That's the, the That's first. exactly right. But it, all, but it allows you to take all those deductions and tax credits that you wouldn't have been able to if you filed separately. Hmm. So you sort of get the best of both worlds in that situation. Interesting. So I know that there, there are uh, some youths uh, up in the capital there that have their own little businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to go through the same procedures that most of us do, I would imagine. Just, Absolutely. Right. The tax laws are, do not discriminate because of age. Yeah, it's a non-discriminatory <laughs> That's agency. right. Everybody has to file, you know, follow the same, the same tax laws. So right. uh, uh, it doesn't make any difference if you're 16 or, or 66 and you have a business, you've got to do the same thing. Uh, sole proprietor, as I understand you are, is the easiest way to, uh, to conduct a small business because there's only a couple of extra forms that go right along with your personal tax return. Right. You don't have to file a separate corporation return or something like that or a partnership. So it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. But somebody who's a sole proprietor ought to look into uh, becoming a limited liability company. Just going to ask you about that. What are the <laughs> advantages of a, of a limited liability versus? Uh... The, the, the limited, liability, limited liability company is not a federal tax status. The limited liability uh, designation is, again, uh, given by the state, and it limits your personal liability uh, due to any business uh, problems. It, it, all it does is it, it essentially um, puts up your business assets to cover any of, of your liabilities. They would not be able to uh, go in and, and take your house if you owned a house. If you're just sole proprietor and without any liability limitation, unless you're insured somehow, then everything's fair game coming after you personally for everything. Right. You, can, you can do the same thing with a, with a corporation, and a, and a small business would become a subchapter S corporation, which does essentially the same thing. It limits your liability. But if you're a single um, uh, small business owner, the extra step of, of that extra tax return, you have to file a, a tax return for the corporation, and then you get a K-1, you put it on your, on your own um, tax return. If you don't have any employees, Maybe the limited liability uh, designation with a sole proprietor may be the way to go. Wow. If you have another person with you, now you're looking at maybe the possibility of a partnership. Partnerships are much less formal than corporations. Uh, so you can, you can start up a car. We could start a partnership before I left here tonight, and, uh, and we wouldn't have to go to a lawyer. We could just sit down and write up a partnership agreement, and, and we would be in business. We'd have to file another par partnership return decide how we're going to split the assets, the liabilities. We'd each get a K-1, which would carry over to our uh, personal tax returns. But as a sole proprietor, the limited liability uh, designation is, is a real advantage. And there really aren't any disadvantages, except I think you owe the state 100 bucks every year. Uh, interesting. But that's worth it to limit your, your personal liability in case, you know, as a businessman, something happens that uh, uh, you put your own personal assets at risk. At risk. Well, we're going to take a break right now, and we'll be right back and uh, resume our conversation with, uh, with Dick. Number 32 million. 108. 109. 110. Introducing Block Live, a new service that basically turns your home into an H&R Block office. Did you have any other jobs this year? Get your taxes done for you, right then and there, via video conference with a tax professional. And welcome back to uh, Gate City Chronicle. I'm here with my guest, uh, Dick Hendel from the H&R Block, and uh, we're just continuing our conversation about your taxes. Uh, Dick, uh, could I ask you a, a couple more questions here? Absolutely. Uh, about uh, some myth myths. What happens if you file early? Uh, good question, Kevin. People think that because they file early, they've got to pay when they file. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, we encourage people to file as early as they can for, for several reasons. First of all, it helps, the, it helps the IRS, actually, that they don't get a whole bunch of, of returns at the last minute. It gives the client a chance to review their information with us, and if they have to go back and get some more information, they, can ha they still have time to go back and get that. Without being penalized. Without being penalized, right. And if they've made a mistake or if their return isn't accepted for some reason, we've got a little bit of time to retrieve that, too. But filing early does not mean you have to pay early. Nobody has to pay their taxes before the deadline. Again, th this year it's the 17th of April. If we file somebody's return electronically, we give them a copy of the return. If they owe money, we give them a voucher and an envelope. And they can mail that voucher and get it postmarked by midnight of the deadline, and it'll be, it'll be filed and paid on time. So just because you owe, think you owe money 
Don't use that as an excuse to put off filing because that leads to errors. Right, and errors we do not want. Well, uh, let's talk about head of household. Head of household. Head of household is a very interesting filing status. Uh, you can be head of household, but you've got to have what's called qualifying individuals living with you. If you and I decided to share an apartment, neither one of us would be head of household because we don't have any relationship. In order to be a head of household, you've got to have either a qualifying child, which is, could be your own child or somebody, a, a lineal or ancestor or a lineal descendant's child, or your parents, your grandparents, uh, your, your brothers and sisters, uh, and, and of course your children. So it, the, the status depends on having somebody living with you who's related to you and lives with you for at least uh, half the year. You can claim somebody as a dependent that has no relationship. If I was supporting you, you didn't earn more than $3,700, you lived with me all year, I could claim you as a dependent. That would not make me head of household because you are not a qualifying individual to qualify me as head of household. Hmm. There's one peculiar, peculiarity in the law that if a married couple does not live together for the last six months of the year, and I mean at any time, and one of the spouses has dependent children with them, they can be considered unmarried for tax purposes and they can file as head of household. The spouse has to file separately, married filing separately. So this head of household is a very strange kind of a filing status. Does that affect a lot of military families, I would imagine? No. It, military families, just because they're living apart, they are still considered to be filing jointly unless they're, uh, unless they're separated legally or something like that. But I'm talking about people who just decide that they're not going to live together anymore and uh, you know, one, they go off and get separate, separate dwellings. Whoever's got the children can be head of household. Right. And, and that is the advantage there is most people in that situation uh, don't itemize their deductions so that their standard deduction is higher. If they itemize their deductions, it doesn't make any difference, and we just as soon file them, um, either married filing jointly, if they can, can get the other spouse to sign the return. Right. Otherwise, we'll file them head of household, as long as their income would, would uh, substantiate that. Because in order to file as head of household, you have got to provide more than one half of the support for the household. So if you're a single parent, for example, and you have, let's say you have two children, and, you, and you've earned uh, $10,000 but you're getting uh, some kind of fuel assistance, you might be in Section 8 housing, you might be getting other state payments. If those payments exceed your income, now you are not providing more than half of the support to that household, and you cannot legally claim to be head of household. You've got to file singly. Which is a nice segue into my next question, deductions. Okay. What are some of the, the more overlooked deductions that people uh, should be taking advantage of? Okay. The single most overlooked deduction is personal property tax. Now, personal property tax here in, in New Hampshire is the tax you pay when you register your vehicle, the amount you pay to the city. It's got to be what's called an ad valorem tax, that the tax has got to be proportional to the value of the asset. When you go to register your car, the, 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 the town or city clerk has a table, most often it's computerized, and there's a mill rating that they apply to the value of your, of your car. Mm -hmm. You pay the city, that is a personal property tax, that is deductible under, under taxes. So we have people who come in year after year and that's the first thing they forget, personal property tax. Fortunately, it's on your registration. So if they have their car with them, they can go out in the car and get the registration. Does, does that apply to boats and RVs and, and anything that you Anything have to... that is proportional to the value of the vehicle or not only vehicle, but the asset. Now, states like, for example, Florida and in, in Indiana have what's called a tangible, a tangible property tax, which is the same kind of a thing. Florida used to, they've repealed that law, uh, apply a tax on the value of your investments every year. Indiana does a similar thing on the value of your personal property. So as long as it is proportional to the value of the property, then it's deductible. A state like New Jersey, for example, that applies a similar kind of a tax on the weight of the vehicle, that's not, that doesn't qualify because that does not, it's not dependent on the value. Interesting. So there's all these kinds of little quirks. Medical and dental expenses fall into this uh, overlooked deduction category in, in many ways. First of all, a lot of people don't realize that if you have long-term care insurance, 
the premium that you pay for long-term care insurance is deductible, but it's on a sliding scale. Oh, that's interesting. If you are in certain age brackets, an increasing percentage of your premium is deductible as a medical and dental expense. So that's another question that is, is, is often overlooked. You know, do you have long-term care insurance? Long-term care. Now, does that, is, are, are we including nursing care as far in long-term care, or are we talking about disability insurance? No, or? we're talking, you know, if somebody has to go into a nursing home or, or, or assisted living or something right. like that, and the long-term care will pay if you can't meet usually two of the five daily um, activities, right. like dressing yourself, feeding yourself, that type of thing. So if your insurance policy covers that, then the premium is deductible, and as you get older, you can, you can deduct a greater percentage of the premium. All right, I'm a little gray on this still. Sure. So uh, I happen to have a friend who, uh, who they, they've been paying into that free, uh, a pre-care type of uh, policy where they're, they're not in a nursing home or anything like that, but they've been paying on a policy. Is that deductible? If it provides for in-home care if they're disabled, right. yeah. If it's a long-term care policy, and most of them, you don't have to necessarily move into a nursing home. You can be at home and, and, and have somebody like a visiting nurse or somebody come in and, and tend to you because you can't uh, get dressed or you can't eat yourself, uh, eat, right. feed yourself. Things. Yeah, that would, be, that would be deductible. Oh, that's very interesting. I'm sure that, that information is helpful to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And if you've not done that, you can go back and amend the last three tax years and add that to your deductions and, and get a, a slight refund for, um, for that uh, oversight. In fact, anything that you find that you've made a mistake on your tax return, the last three years are considered to be what's called open tax years, and you can go back and amend those. Okay. Beyond that, uh, you can't amend them. If you haven't filed, the IRS will still make you, may make you file, and unfortunately, if you owe money, you'll still owe money, but if you get a refund, you won't get it back. <laughs> so that's another reason for filing on time. Right. Get your refund. And make sure you sign that form. Exactly. Make sure you sign that form. So. Now, other medical deductions that are overlooked are things like mileage and parking and tolls. If I'm driving to, uh, to, to, let's say you're driving down 93 to Boston and you go through the toll and you have to park to go to Mass General or something, the mileage is deductible and it's gone up to 23.5 cents a mile from 19 cents. The tolls that you go through are deductible and the parking is deductible. A lot of people don't realize that. All that stuff adds up. All that stuff adds up. And that's why you need to keep a contemporaneous log right. because if you're sitting at my desk get, doing your taxes and I say, well, how many miles did you drive? The favorite response is they look up at the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. the, and they, they, you know, the answers may be written on the ceiling tiles. but I can't relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's dollars out of their pocket if, if they can't you know, come up with, uh, with the information. Co-pays. People don't realize that co-pays, when you go to the doctor, right, you have health insurance, co-pays are still part of that deductibility. And most people, because you have to exceed 7.5% of your adjusted gross income in order to start uh, claiming these expenses, right. most people think that, oh, I'm never going to meet that. Well, my attitude is that you may, and if you do, isn't it a shame that you didn't keep all these records the, the right. entire year? 7% is quite high. 7.5% is quite high. It's going to go to 10% once Obamacare comes into uh, to uh, how many? How long can these people get beat down? Oh, boy, it's just tax, the, the, the tax system is just out of control. And I don't know this is how you make your living, and, but it just seems... Uh, I, I would be in favor of a flat tax and be put out of business tomorrow. It'd be right. quite, quite 999? <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, I was just throwing that out there. <laughs> I, know, I'm just, I don't, I don't I want to see a value-added tax added to all the taxes we've got already. Right. Because did you ever see a tax repealed? Never. You just give the powers that be another way to collect money, and, that, and they'll all go up. Look at the, what's happening in Europe. Right. I was watching the debates, and they were talking about the, uh, you know, what would you consider fair, mm -hmm. a fair tax. Mm -hmm. And uh, as they were talking, I, I think Newt mentioned 15% flat tax, and I think uh, Centaurum was at 35%. Yeah. Perry was 20. And Perry was 20. Romney was 25 or something. There's, there's, there's got to be some level. Right. But you you. You probably have heard that 47% of the people in this country pay no federal income tax at all. I heard that. And so the other portion is uh, obviously the middle guy. They're, they're paying a big... A, I know that the, the rich are paying 60% of all over, the Over $250,000 pays somewhere around 65% of all the taxes paid. That doesn't seem like a rich person anymore. 
Mm, no. <laughs> but I don't make that, just yeah. for the record. Me neither. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, getting back to some of the yeah. deductions, I, right. I just, uh, it would be really nice to see some of this. I, I can only see this getting more complicated as time goes on. I have to agree. Uh, I have to agree. Uh, so Especially once we get the, the, the Obamacare in there, that's going to affect a lot of aspects of, of our daily lives and of the tax code, too. But let's get back to medical and dental, for example. A lot of people have the opportunity to open up a flexible spending account. Have you, are you familiar with flexible spending accounts? Mm -hmm. Many employers, they tend to be larger employers, allow their, their employees to identify in certain categories, and medical and dental care is one, child care is another, um, and there are one or two others depending on what the company wants to put in there, that you can put pre-tax dollars in to this flexible spending account. So let's say that, okay, I think I'm going to spend $3,000 on medical bills. That gets taken out of my pay pre-tax. So now I haven't paid any tax on this $3,000. When I go to the doctor, the dentist, or whatever, I just submit bills to my company, and they draw out of this account. account. Right. Now, so I've paid $3,000 of my medical and dental or other ex related expenses tax-free. I didn't have to get it above 7.5% to get that tax-free benefit. That flexible spending account gives me that tax-free benefit from dollar one. Now, if you don't spend it all in a year, you lose the balance. To so it, 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 it goes back into the company. So a lot of people say, well, I don't know how much I'm going to spend, so I'm not going to open up a, an FSA. My, re my reaction to that is, well, okay, let's, let's take a look at the numbers. Let's say you're in the 25% tax bracket. Let's say you put $4,000 into an FSA. You've just saved yourself $1,000 in taxes. So you're really putting $3,000 of your own money and $1,000 of Uncle Sam's money into that FSA. Mm -hmm. So you can afford to give up $1,000, and it hasn't cost you a cent. Right. And if you, if you spend $3,500 of that $4,000, now you're $500 ahead of the game. So don't look at it as though if I lose $1, I've lost that dollar because you've gained in taxes. Exactly. And the same thing is true with dependent care, child care. You can put up to $5,000 of child care into a, uh, an account like that. Pay that money pre-tax. Hmm. So there's a, there are a lot of company benefits in this. It's not a direct tax deduction, but it's a deduction in, in the sense that you can take money that would be taxed out of the taxable range and put it into, into pre-tax dollars. That has another, another uh, advantage in that it's reduced your adjusted gross income now. You're not paying taxes on that. It's not on your tax return. And many of the things that are phased out, well, it, just the 7.5% is based on your adjusted gross income. If you can reduce that adjusted gross income, now that 7.5% has been reduced. Hmm. The same thing is true with miscellaneous deductions that are subject to a 2% adjusted gross income uh, limit. And there are many of those, and most employees don't even get above that. Speaking of miscellaneous uh, deductions, I'm curious. Uh, uh, parents, they, they love their children. Mm -hmm. They send them to either dance or they send them to uh, special ed, ed programs. Are, are any of those extracurricular educational type of programs deductible uh, on, on any level? In general, the answer is no. The, the, the um, ex exception might be if it's a special education because it's they're a special needs student or something, okay. it might be deductible under medical and dental. But those kinds of things are not deductible under miscellaneous deductions. The types of things that, that fall into that category are generally employee business expenses, for example. Let's say that you uh, belong to a professional society. Well, that's related to your job. That's a miscellaneous deduction, but it's subject to a 2% floor, so you've got to get again above that 2%. Right. So if your AGI is $50,000, the first $1,000 you're going to have to pay taxes on. Right. And that is one reason why you should try to get your employer to reimburse you for employee business expenses and not have, the, have you write them off on your, on your tax return. And as a self-employed individual, you are not subject to that 2% on your business portion. So you can deduct $1 against your business income on all of your business-related um, expenses. Re regarding um, miscellaneous. Mm -hmm. If you get too high on your miscellaneous deductions, that doesn't that generally run, uh, run a red flag for the IRS? Um, what will happen first is that you'll be subject usually to the uh, alternative minimum tax, mm -hmm. which is 
essentially another tax system that's running in the background here that's supposed to limit the ability to deduct uh, a lot of things uh, outside of the, the usual amount. In the alternative minimum tax world, for example, miscellaneous deductions subject to the 2% limit are not allowed, so you add those right on back into your, into, your, into your income. State and local tax deductions are not allowed, you add that back in. And then when you get to the bottom and figure out your alternative minimum tax income, there's a larger standard deduction that gets applied to that depending on your filing status and your income. Then it's usually taxed at a flat 26%. If, it's, if you're in a, in a higher bracket, you, some of it's taxed at 28%. You add those together and you compare that with what your tax is on the, in the regular tax world and you pay the larger. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> well, that brings me to another question because I had mentioned the red flag. Right. Red flag, generally for most of us, seems to think uh, bring up the topic of audits. Audits, yes, everyone's favorite topic. Oh, yes. so audits. Uh, in fact, I just uh, helped an individual through an audit uh, last week, and uh, I first I have to say that most people have the misconception that the IRS is out to get you. I have never, in all the audits and all my dealings with IRS agents, run into one person that was not a professional, polite, and really interested in getting at the right answer. Okay. Their job is to make sure you're paying your taxes according to the law, and that's, that's reasonable. But if you're audited for some reason, and the only, usually the reason that you're audited is because every return is run through a computer, and the IRS has set up rather limits, let's say uh, charitable contributions. The average person in, in a particular income level contributes some maybe between 10 and 20 percent of their income. Well, if you come along and, and you've got 30 percent in that same bracket, it's going to get kicked out and an agent's going to look at it. And they may write you a letter and say, gee, we'd like you to send in your justification for these uh, charitable contributions. Right. That is not going to red flag you for next year, as long as you don't run through the same wickets and get kicked out again. Right. In fact, if the IRS audits you one year in the last two for a particular reason and does not make any change to your tax return, and they audit you in the third year, they send you a letter in the third year, you can write them back and say, gee whiz, you just audited me two years ago for the same thing and there was no change, and they'll just they'll cancel the audit. So they're not out to look at people often as long as they're not identified by the same... Uh, screening right. that they were year after year. So if you get audited, if you're, you get this, this, the letter saying, well, we're going to come to your house uh, or, or we're, we would like to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Right. Do we call you right away? Um, we encourage you, uh, any client of ours, in fact, even if you're not a client, to contact us right away because there are several reasons for that. First of all, you have to answer by a certain date. They'll give you a, a date. You know, the, in the audit I was just referring to, the individual got the letter please call us within 10 days to set up an appointment, um, which was done. If you don't do that, then you're going to get another letter that is a little bit stronger. The worst thing you want to do is to ignore an IRS letter, right. or a state letter for that matter of fact. Right. You do not want to do that. You're just digging yourself a bigger hole. What, what we do generally is we'll, we'll see what the, what the situation is, we'll review your tax return, we'll make a judgment whether or not this is, is, a, is, a, is a problem that we're going to need to deal with, the IRS makes mistakes too. And if they say, well, the IRS made a mistake, we just write them a, a letter, send it back, or call the agent, explain the situation, and generally it will be taken care of. Many times, and the ones that we have to go into the office, they're looking for uh, the client to bring in their records. Right. So the first thing we do is to decide, okay, what records are they asking for? Because they have to be specific in what they're looking for. We'll help the client organize the records. We'll, we'll work with them to organize it in the best way that presents their information in the best light. Go in, and usually what I'll ask the client to do is we make two copies. We leave one with the agent because we don't want to have him sit there and do it while we're waiting. But they'll ask a range of questions. They'll generally uh, say, well, we'll get back to you. And in a week or two, you'll get a, an adjudication. If you don't agree with it, you can not agree with it. You have your reasons why you don't agree with it. If you agree with it and you owe money, then you, know, you get out your checkbook and write. But 
as many times you get a refund as you do owe more. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Because an agent will go through and say, well, gee, you know, in case of small businesses particularly, you know, did you realize that this was, that this was deductible? Or, and then they'll correct it in, in that way also. So you're not going to get red flag just because you've been audited. And a lot of people think that immediately they're going to have a lien or a levy put on their house or their car. That, that does not happen until a whole bunch of other things that you haven't done right. have gone by. And, and ignoring IRS letters is one quick way to, uh, to get yourself in that situation. Well, you see the commercials over and over and over again. Uh, listen, if the IRS is auditing you, uh, call us. You see that a lot. A lot. The more I see that commercial, the more I tend to think there's a problem out there, that somebody's making some money on this. Uh, so there, there are probably a lot more people than we realize that are in, in hot water, basically because they've neglected to, to talk to the IRS or, or get somebody to advocate for them. Right, right. right. Now, H&R um, Block, for example, guarantees their work. You come in to me with the records and, and I prepare a tax return. Part of that fee that you're gonna pay me includes if I've made a mistake based on the information you've provided or the IRS disagrees with the way I've handled it, we're gonna pay, we're gonna reimburse you for your interest and penalties. Mm -hmm. You would be responsible for additional taxes. For an additional $35, we'll guarantee that return and we'll pay or reimburse you up to $5,500 of any additional tax that's due besides paying your interest and penalties. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, if you're audited, we'll go along with you with no additional charge. We'll help you prepare for it, we'll go there, we'll defend you. So for $35, it'll, it, it essentially insures you for the three years. It's cheap insurance there's, policy. There's no other company in, 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 the, in the country that does that. In fact, if you go, a lot of CPAs will charge you extra to correct their own mistakes. Audits are, can be expensive things if you go to a company like you're just referring to. And it's interesting that Massachusetts just did a study of all of the settlements that they uh, agreed to with taxpayers of Massachusetts, and not one could have been, uh, had an outcome any better if you hired one of those folks, one of those, one of those companies. Interesting. So, and now, of course, H&R Block is, rates a little better, obviously. No, they didn't, they didn't go into who did it. They okay. just said, you know, they were, they were comparing the kinds of companies that put on these commercials, you know, if you owe $10,000 or more. Uh, that they don't have, we don't have any secret ways of dealing with the IRS that the average taxpayer doesn't have. There, there's right. no special rules for, you know, the people who advertise on TV or enrolled agents or, or CPAs or tax attorneys. We, play, we pay by the, play by the same rules as everybody does. We may understand them a little bit better and know how to put, put them together so that it shows the client's information in a little bit better light than if you did it yourself. But we're all playing by the same rules. How long have you been with our uh, with HR block? Yeah, HR. This is this is my fifteenth year. Fifteenth year. So they've been around. They've been around for a while, actually. But well, the, we've got people in our office at the Pheasant Lane Mall who have been there even longer than I have. We've got one woman who's been there for twenty-five. Another fellow has been there for eighteen. So there's a lot of experience, uh, and we can do a lot of complicated returns. And people don't realize that. They they think that all we can do, you know, simple tax returns. But we can do corporations. We can do partnerships. We can do. Uh, S corps, we can do with the whole the whole range. Estates, trusts. Are there any other final thoughts that you want to leave with us? Uh, with our well, with I guess the only thing that um, I'd like to leave with you is that taxes, while they're scary, and most people are, I'm a, my heart takes a little bit of a double beat when I get a, if I get a letter from the IRS, which I have. If you take the time to organize your information, ask the right questions, and maybe get a little professional help you shouldn't have any problems. And if you do, there are ways of, of solving them without uh, any real difficulty, any real expense, unless you're trying to pull the wool over their eyes. Right. Which, you, know, okay. you don't ever want to try to do that, because they, yeah, they'll, find you. they'll get you for that. Yeah. So let me ask you one final question. Sure. If somebody wants to get in touch with you or, or your office or an H&R uh, an Block mm -hmm. agent, where do they call? Well, if you want to call the, H, the, uh, <laughs> the Pheasant Lane Mall office, you can Reach us at 888-4315, uh, right here in, in Nashua. We're down at the Fez Lane Mall in Sears. Uh, there are other offices in the area. There's one on Broad Street. There's one on Main Street in Nashua. There's one in Hudson. There's one in Milford. If you want the closest office, you can just dial 1-800-HR-BLOCK, and uh, you can get that information. You can go on uh, hrblock.com, find an office, put in your zip code, and they'll give you a whole 
range of offices within uh, whatever distance you want to, uh, to, to specify. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show, and I, I look forward to you coming back maybe uh, just before everybody has to file, if that would be okay. I'd be happy to do that, Kevin, and thanks for having us. This has been a very, very enjoyable experience. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you for uh, joining us here with uh, Gate City Chronicle. Uh, we're here to help local businesses, uh, the community, get you, know, get you to know what's going on around you. And uh, we want to thank our sponsors, National Steam Cleaning and Aardvark uh, Carpet Cleaning, uh, for sponsoring this show. And uh, until next week, we'll see you around. Thanks a lot.